Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel. If you're watching on YouTube, please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or we post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. All right, let's open our Bibles tonight, Revelation chapter 18, as we continue our journey through this last book in the Bible. Hopefully you've been with us. If not, all of the studies are available online. They are in the archives. All of the notes that we give you each week are also available in the bookstore if you've missed any. We also have a printed copy of those notes in a booklet um, that we put together a few years ago. That's a little smaller, but if it's easier to tote around, you can look into that. In the past uh, couple of weeks, we have come to the end of God's judgments upon unbelieving man. We looked at the final seven bull judgments. They are poured out, prepared in chapter 15, poured out in chapter 16. <clears throat> and they really do effectively end the judgments of the Lord before his return in chapter 19. Yet, as the Lord often does, before he moves us forward chronologically, he stops us to have us look around and understand other things that are happening at the time. And so these last two chapters, the one we looked at last week, chapter 17, one we will look at uh, chapter 18 tonight before we slow down because we want to enjoy what is coming next, um, is really the, the Lord's assessment of man's ways that he wants us to consider. In chapter 17, it is God's word to man about his religious ways. We spent all week last week looking at it. What does God think about religion? What does religion do to us? Um, and how does it blind us? Tonight in chapter 18, we are going to look at the picture of man in his pursuits, materialistically, uh, power hungry. It is, it is all evidenced in, both of them, the final world government of the Antichrist. God labels them Babylon because it is certainly Babylon-like, if you will, where false religion began, if you will, and the quest for life without God is found. And so it is, is metaphorically used in that way. Man's self-centered and kind of self-dependent religion will find its zenith, if you will, will find its absolute best expression or, or, or most obvious expression in the, in the worship of the beast. Man's commercial desires and worldly wants and lust for gain and and all will be personified, if you will, in the Antichrist as he touts a government without God. That Here's man at his best. This is what we want. This is how we're going to run life. And so this is God's kind of statement against both religion and commerce as, as it is found in the world without God. And it is that, those things that bind men's hearts. In fact, you know, they are both fallen with the judgment in chapter 16. They will not, both not rise again before the, the Lord of Lords, but religion and commerce are two altars where man has come to worship since he fell into sin, and both of those have failed him. And so before Jesus comes, and before, as these judgment of chapter 16 have come and gone, and we said to you, they only, they're going to last days, not weeks. You can't survive without water and, and all. Um, but at the same time, here's God's assessment. He wants you to know before Jesus comes that this is the defeat of everything that man has sought to do without him. And so as we looked at religion and, and man's worldliness, it is, I think, awesome to realize, at least for us, that God has brought us out of a sin-dominated life. You've been delivered by the goodness of God. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said, you he has made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in ones which you walked in according to the course of this world. The word course, weather vane. Wherever the wind was blown, that's where you went. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit is working in uh, of disobedience that works in those who uh, not, don't, don't know the Lord. And, and we conducted ourselves, Paul writes to the Ephesians, according to the lusts of our flesh. And we were by nature the children of wrath, either as, as others were. But God, who was rich in mercy towards us, while we were yet sinners, he made us alive with Christ. By his grace, you've been saved. So God brought us out of what we're reading tonight. There's a whole world that's still trapped in to religious life and, and the pursuit of gain, which is what drives most of the known world. So even here at the end of the tribulation, we still find those who refuse to receive Jesus as Lord, 
who place their worship and values and desire in their religious ways or in their commercial ways, and they will suffer the loss of everything. So if you want to put these two chapters where they belong, and I mentioned last week, Gerard and I were talking about it, it's like reading a tombstone. God buries the ways of man. And here lies religion. <laughs> With all that it's promised, it ends up nowhere. And here lies the commercial pursuits of man, the money, the gain, the power, because that too ends. It's left here. And so if you want, these two chapters are the view near the end of the broad and the wide road. It's where you stand and see where it drops off. It is at the end of those who love riches so much that it has choked the world, or the word, I should say, out of their life. It, it is it's at the end of those who store treasures upon the earth. It is at the end of defiance and idol worship. It is at the end of the ways of Cain, who decided he would do whatever he wanted. It, it all ends up at the end, and Jesus wins, and all that loses. So you're in a good place tonight. You're standing with the, the victor and the king. Last week we saw, like I said, God's view of religion, its, its, its start, its influence, the destructive kind of blounding power that it has, the ultimate end, the, the seduction and the, the deceptiveness of, of sin and what it can do to the man's heart. It was all kind of reflected in this metaphor that Jesus used of a, or, or, or the, the, the angel told John of the, of the harlot decked out and, and on the prowl looking for takers. And we saw last time that the world's religion will, at least for three and a half years, support with great enthusiasm the rise of this Antichrist to power. It'll be a religious move. <laughs> but it is at that halfway point when the Antichrist is really seen for who he is and what he's up to, that they will turn against they, the Antichrist, the beast, the dragon, against the church, and really outlaw any worship at all unless it's him. But by then it is certainly too late. And you can read about that in, in the end there of chapter 17 when you meet the real beast. From the beginning, from the day that Adam and Eve bowed their knee obediently to the serpent's suggestion there in the garden, to this point, <laughs> false religion has, has, has led many astray, but it stops here. Jesus is coming. There will be no more false religion. And there will be no more vain kind of pursuit of gain. Throughout history, there is always a, a faithful remnant that survives in, in all of these things. In the seven letters that you might have been with us when we went through chapters two and three, the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the, to the churches, five of them contain calls to repentance. So not, not every church, and certainly most churches, need you know, something that, you know, think that they're getting through scot-free. We, we need to. Be, be sure that we're not caught up in a religious relationship with God or in the commercial ways of life. You know, this big, big faith movement of the 80s and 90s where you just claim it, you know, speak it into existence and, you know, God wants everybody to be rich is nothing more than a reflection of Satan's lies um, in this movement that you, that you read about here in chapter 18. The Laodicean church, which was the last church, made the Lord so nauseous that he threatened to spew them out of his mouth. So there's a big battle here for the saints even with these things that oppose us. It is no wonder that Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13, be sure that you examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Test yourself. Don't you know yourself that Jesus is in you unless indeed you're disqualified? So you want to be sure of where you stand. And certainly these things that we're reading tonight were written to the church because by, by this time you're, you're long gone and it's really too late. In fact, chapter 18 is too late, right? You're done in chapter 15 and 16. But it is written as a warning to all of us who would look forward to that day. It is easy to find the flaws in others, a little harder to see our flaws in our own life. The, psalm, the psalmist wrote, I think, Psalm 26, verse 2, Examine me, Lord, prove me. Try me, my mind, and try my heart. So um, it's, it's good to, to know that, that these things have an end and, and there's no life to be found here. So, so tonight we're going to look at these 20, what is it, three, four verses. Uh, it is one final view from the Lord through John before Jesus returns. Like I said, we're slowing down next week because we're, we're getting excited about the chorus in heaven and the Jesus on the right horse and you riding horses and the enemy defeated, and the 
the thousand year reign of Christ, which I believe is covered in six verses, <laughs> or the new heaven and the new earth, which is covered in six verses. We're going to have to do a lot of work to figure out what those are since we only have six verses. But I'm looking forward to what the Lord has for us and, and what I think we can learn. So here's God's last word before he sends his back, uh, son back. But this is the comment about the political and the commercial life of man ungoverned by the principles in the heart of God. Or if you want, life in the world without the Lord. Right? This is the way the world behaves itself and the things that it pursues. It's the worldly example of man seeking life and satisfaction without God and being involved. And you can just turn on your TV every day of the week. You can hear politics raging at itself. This is the solution, and it's never the solution. The solution is when Jesus comes and gets rid of it all. That'll be the solution. So as man's religion was epitomized in this last rule of the beast, so we will find that man in heart pursue of all of these other gains in life will end with this judgment, and it is now judgment day. The Lord has allowed this to continue for quite some time, but no longer. And remember where we are, at the end of the Great Tribulation, right before Jesus comes back, and you've been gone for seven years now in the presence of the Lord. All right, chapter 18, verse 1 says this. After these things, John writes, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. <clears throat> he had great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. So here comes an angel, very powerful, great authority, delegated by God to do a work in his name. Maybe he's the stone thrower at the end of the chapter in verse 21. I don't know. But he was, he was a glorious angel who, who lit up the skies and all of the earth around him you know, shone, if you will. And he cried loudly with a loud, or mightily with a loud voice, and he said this, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become, an, and by the way, every time anything's repeated more than once, it's like an exclamation point both in Hebrew and in Greek. It just, it emphasizes. So it's fallen, all right, it's fallen. And it has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Fallen. The, the verb here is in the aorist tense in Greek, which means usually, and, and here as well, of something that's been a completed action. It's almost like a past tense. But the aorist tense is usually used when something is described as past tense, but it has yet to happen. But it is so sure that it is going to happen that God speaks about it as if it's already happened. So that's what the aorist tense means. The Lord says it's coming down. <laughs> Has it come down? No. It still hasn't come down. But it is as sure as the Lord's word is sure it is going to fall. As with man's religious systems, his political and commercial interests that are found in the Babylonian way of life after the flood uh, there in ancient, ancient Babylon, uh, Babylon used to be a city and then it became a world empire, but it ran its commercial and its pol uh, political ways in, consul in consulting from the Lord's standpoint. They, they got their information from the devil, from, from the demons of hell, and they developed a life of extreme excesses without much control. And so from God's standpoint, man in his commercial and political pursuits are almost like, uh, you know, being counseled by the devil and without shame or control runs forward. The, the system of, of commerce that God is going to comment to us about continues to this day in, in literally every culture. It doesn't matter if you're poor or rich around the globe. There is always this desire for gain and there is this push forward. Here now, when the Lord moves against it once for all, once I should say and for all, the place will be seen for what it is. And the Lord says, this is what I see in the commercial world of, the, of, of man, a gathering place for fallen angels and demon spirits and, and hateful birds. <laughs> it's an interesting simile because Jesus in the parables always spoke of the birds and they always represented wickedness, Satan behind the scenes. And I suspect that's the illusion here. It's the only one that is comparable in the scriptures. Um, it, it interests me in, in reading... Uh, I don't know if you read the Wall Street Journal. There's a lot of business publications that, are, that come out uh, weekly and monthly. But there's this tremendous increase in, in man team managements of larger corporations to incorporate you know, Eastern mysticism and spiritism into their upper-level management teams in the hopes of getting the edge on their competition in terms of productivity or, 
or performance, if you will, to inspire their staff. And yet that's the way the world works, man. Whatever it does to get ahead a little bit, you know, that's what we want. And then I just go back to Revel, uh, Ephesians 2.1. He, he, when you were dead, <laughs> he's made you alive. This won't make you alive. This will kill you. Ancient Babylon, which, like I said, was a city and later an empire, was in full bloom in the 6th century B.C. when the Lord spoke about her future as becoming desolate. Read Isaiah chapter 13 and 14. Read uh, Jeremiah chapter 50. And 51, there are four chapters that have a near-term fulfillment in, in the history of Israel and a long-term prophetic fulfillment here. That, that the ways of man to pursue gain is going to destroy him. Notice in verse 3 that we read, Now, or, or for, I should say, all of the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the world have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Notice that the influence of this commercialism is infectious to everyone who is in contact with it. Leaders, people, polluting the whole earth. The fornication here is with the flesh. The constant wants and allurements, the merchants have become rich using the truth that man is a, is a slave or enslaved to his wants. The term luxuries here is, is that of alluring man to stray away. What, do whatever it takes to get this because you have to have this in your life. And it is such a dominating influence that verse 3 tells us, verse 2 tells us the demons are at work, but the verse 3 tells us it, it, is, it is through this longing for luxury that others have become well a wealthy, uh, just as religion, if you looked at chapter 17, verse 2, had intoxicated many, so this desire for riches and pleasure and power and money and success has driven nations to action, to where they'll do just about everything to get it. Read 2 Timothy, you know, where, where it says that they, they, the world will not, in the last days, endure sound doctrine, but they will, according to their own desires, find teachers that will scratch what itches them. They'll, they'll surround themselves. Please tell me something that I can get rich by. And here's the latest. Oh, that's what I want. And so they pursue those things, if you will. James wrote in chapter 4, where, where does the fighting and wars come from among you? They come from your desires for pleasure. And it causes war in your members and you murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and you war. You have not because you ask not. You, you receive not because you ask amiss. You just want to spend it on your own pleasures. It's the same picture. It's the broad brush that the Lord says, here's what I've come to destroy. And so because we, we, we got to the last judgments before the Lord comes, you know, it, it is God's will that he lays out for us. These are the things that will destroy you. We, we, we've received certainly that warning in the Bible. John was 90 when he wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, don't love the world or the things that are in the world because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And then he went on to say everything that's in the world, the lust of your flesh and the, the lust of your eyes and the pride of life, they're not of the Lord. The world's passing away. And so is its less. But if you do the will of God, you'll abide forever. You'll get to chapter 19, <laughs> or you'll end here in, in chapter 17, 16, 17, and 18. We've been delivered from these worldly allurements so that we don't have to be caught in them. We read in verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sin and unless you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Now, again, because this is written ahead of time, here's God's heart to everyone that will listen. Get away from them. They're headed for disaster. Certainly this call from the Lord is found biblically in every generation and prophetically just about everywhere else as well. When the nation of Israel was was taken captive, um, 
by the Babylonians in 606 through 586. 10 or 12 years later, 575, the prophet Jeremiah was sent by the Lord to speak. And the Lord said through Jeremiah to the people that were only in captivity for 30 years, and they would be there for 40 more years. But he said this to them, flee out of the midst of Babylon, save your life. Do not get cut off in her iniquities when the time of the Lord's vengeance come and he will repay. Babylon is a golden cup in the Lord's hands. The earth has drunk of it. The nations have drank her wine. They have become deranged. Babylon will fall quickly and be destroyed. Wail for her. Take balm for her pain. Perhaps she can be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she's not healed. Forsake her. Let everyone return to his own country, for her judgment reaches to the heavens and to the skies. Now, that's in the short term, what was the Lord's word to Israel? Learn from Babylon, who's going to be destroyed. They're your captive now, but they're meeting God because of their idolatry soon enough. But in the long-term picture, it fits exactly here. It's that life in the world, get away, move away, their selfish, driven pursuit of gain is going to go down. It is the same warning that in a bigger picture God gives to us everywhere we turn. The call to separate from the world. Remember in chapter 12 of, of, of Genesis, the Lord said that to Abraham, or, or Abram, get out of the country. Get out of that place of worship of idols and come to a place that I will show you. And the Lord brought him out. When Lot was visited by the angel, the angel said to, Lord, to, to Lot, get your family and get out of here. Don't look back. Don't stay in the valley. Head for the mountains. Get out of here. Judgment is coming. And you know what happened to them. Escape for your... I think there, there's a verse there, ch chapter 19, I think it's verse 17, that just says, escape for your life. Run for the hills. Don't look behind you. Don't stay in the plains. Get to the mountains. You're going to be destroyed if you stay here. Get away. It's, it's kind of what the Lord says to us here today. You can live for gain in this world, but you're going to leave it all here. And eventually, if the Lord comes, it's going to be leveled. It's hard to put your stock in stuff that won't last. Well, it's not going to last. To the saints in 2 Corinthians chapter, what is it, 6, don't be unequally yoked, don't have, you know, what communion is light with darkness, you know, what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? Come out from among them and be separate. Don't touch the unclean thing. I'll receive you. You'll be my sons and daughter. I'll be your Lord. But come out. Well, here's the reason why, because... This life isn't going to last, and this way will not survive. And remember, here's, we're, we're at the end of the tribulation. This is as far as it goes. There's going to be very little time between here and Jesus' thousand-year reign, and then the new heaven and the new earth. So <laughs> there will be no more of this kind of life from this day forward. So separate yourself so you don't have to partake in her sins because that's where she's headed, which is exactly kind of what Timothy you know, when Paul wrote his first letter to Timothy, he said to them, look, we've brought nothing into the world. Be sure that you understand we're not taking anything out with us anyway. And so if you have food and clothing, you should be happy. You should be content. That should really be all that you want. Because if you desire to be rich, you fall into sin, uh, temptations and snares and many foolish, harmful lusts, which will drown men in petition. If, if you love money, it's the root of all evil. <laughs> it, it, it all goes back to that. Right? Nothing wrong with money. It's the love of it. And because this is the life that then is found. O man of God, Paul said to Timothy, flee these things and pursue and said righteousness and faith and goodness and love and patience and gentleness. Do that instead. So well, here, here's God's warning to us again. He protects us as his people from these blinding influences by telling us not to pursue them. You know, historically... If you follow Israel through the Bible and God's dealing with his people, you learn a pretty interesting lesson because before Israel went into captivity to the Babylonians in 606, Israel was primarily an agrarian society. They grew crops, they raised animals, they, they, they took care of themselves in that manner. Over the next 70 years in captivity in Babylon, the most advanced commercial you know, godless society that you could hope to find yourself in, most of the Jews were taken in by the skilled kind of commerce and all 
that they saw and the life that it would provide. And so when the chance was given to these millions of Jews to go back to Jerusalem, 50,000 of them went, yeah, we'd like to go back to nothing, surrounded by bad people, and start from the ground up being agrarian society again. No, no, we like, you know, the switches and the dials and the, and the advances, and, you know, we like to just stay here. And they were unwilling to go back. The, U the U.S. started as an agrarian society. We eventually become an, it became an industrial society, quickly moved to a technological one. But, you know, if, if you go back and just read, you know, our history, a as an agrarian society, children were deemed very valuable to the family. And, and if it's no other reason, then it was another pair of working hands, right? Families needed kids because everyone could work together the, the estimated time back in those days was that kids could earn an extra $50,000 a year for a family by the time that they went to high school. So you found big families and happy families, and everyone had a job to do. Um, but that was then. This is now. <clears throat> now, kids in many ways have become a liability rather than an asset to people's understanding. It's why the abortion rate is so high. It, it is why... You know, an estimated, it cost a parent roughly uh, $350,000 to raise a kid through high school. That's if he goes to public school. And then because of all the commercial needs that we find ourselves facing, there's smaller families, legalized abortion, you know, and, and a bondage to get ahead at all costs because Babylon's alive and well. And it's what dominates the hearts of man. Any move towards commercialism begins to poison the families. Now you have to have mom and dad both work if you're going to keep up with the Joneses. The kids oftentimes are raised by someone else because we, who's got time to stay home and take care of them? We only want the best for them is what we say. But you can't buy the best. You can be the best, but you can't buy the best. And so here is this movement you know, against, if you will, just a relationship with God. But it's a societal movement, both religiously and commercially. In an agrarian society, you will find very little need for psychological help. There was an extended family. There was great unity and love and support. Kids tended to grow up very healthy mentally. They, they tended to mature very early on. They knew they were wanted and, and important, and they played a vital role in the society. But whenever you get to industrialized or technologically advanced societies, people are isolated invariably. They, uh, you know, they're on the computer, they've got the videos in the home, they've got the headsets on. We lose the hardworking, satisfied way of life that was so, so long was so satisfying to everyone. And, and, and you get caught up in the, in the chase and that, whatever that is, you know, to make you happy. I'll give you an example that I've always liked, but it's still a, a practical one. If you go to New Guinea today, most of the country has not changed in the last hundred years. They are primarily agrarian in society you go to america and we, we watch people work all year to take two or three weeks off and you say what are you going to do and they say i want to go fishing go to new guinea they fish every day for food we want to look forward to a long weekend to have a barbecue and camp outside and cook outside they cook outside for the most part every day we want to live under the stars and camp out away from the rat race. Well, they do that every night. They just don't do it in $350,000 motorhomes. So the commercial system and the lusts of man always breed sin. It plays on sin, and it will exploit the hearts of man with, with tremendously false values. Paul, when he wrote to the uh, Philippians in chapter 4, verse 11, he said, I don't want to talk to you in, res in respect to need, but I've learned that whatever state I'm in, I can be content. So that from Paul's point of view, contentment is not what you do or do not have, because he was able to say, I've had a lot, I've had a little, I've still learned to be content. But, but who you know, and, and what your life really is all about. Being content has nothing to do with possessions. What did Paul say to Timothy? Having clothing and food, be content. Same word, be satisfied. What is a diamond really worth? <laughs> Whatever anyone will pay for. The price is set by the, by the corruption in society. 
whatever the you know what if, what if the latest rage is wearing granite <laughs> i don't know seems like it could work but artificial valuing is usually based on societal expectations and outlooks which is babylon at its finest and the lord speaks to that here God's word doesn't change. The values in it don't change. It's true in every generation. It's faith and love and the fruit of God's spirit, and it always works. But, but we will read as we go forward that soon the day is coming in the world where a bag of gold is needed to buy a loaf of bread. And then all of a sudden you start to say, well, maybe if I just had food, I should be content. There has been and will always be a real value found in clothing and food, but one day the world for which man longs and works and labors and, and sacrifice and lusts after, it's all going to be going up in smoke. And it's going to end here. Until then, it will leave you thirsting for more and storing treasures where the thieves will get through and the moth will corrupt. And it, it just doesn't satisfy. So, you know, this isn't a, a preaching sermon to, to, the, to, the, to the saved. This is God's declaration that this will not work. But his people have forsaken this a long time ago. And that's why you're, 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 you're delivered. Until now, verse 5, her sins have reached up to heaven. God has remembered her iniquity. Until now, God has allowed these things to continue. But, but judgment is inescapable. And, and here in chapter 18 has come to pass. It is time to eradicate the system of man that has ruined so many lives which is just what I read to you out of Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 9, where it says, her judgment has reached the heavens and lifted up to the skies. This is the end of things. Verse 6, render to her, the Lord declares, just as she rendered to you, repay her double according to her work in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her, in the measure that she has glorified herself and lived luxuriously in that same measure, give her torment and sorrow, for she has said in her heart, I sit as a queen, not as a widow, and I will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will be in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. So here in keeping with the enormity of her sin, a voice from heaven from the Lord declares in verse 4, give her twice what she is owed for her wickedness. There's no more mercy now. This is chapter 18. This is payday. Payday, reaping what you've sown as the Lord sits to judge. Uh, and I should say this to you. God has waited all of this time according to the verse 5. But God's patience should never be defined as God's approval. Just because he hasn't done anything doesn't mean he approves. Right? He, he, he's tolerant. He's Patient. Thank God he's patient with us. If, if, if we deserve to be wiped out, we'd have all been wiped out. If God decides to get what he's owed, there'll be no one here at the service next week. But God is gracious. However, there's, a, there's an end to these things. Here, notice in verse 7, she has lived glorifying herself, lived in luxury, felt smug about her seemingly endless supply, living for herself, sustained by her power and her ability to gather and sell and surround herself. This will never come to an end, she concludes. This is the, the way I live. It sounds like the Laodicean church. I am rich and wealthy. I'm in need of nothing. Well, that only lasts for a little while. A false sense of security. Yet here now, what does the Lord says? Give her torment and sorrow and immediate loss. Listen to what Isaiah wrote, 700 B.C., about this time. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasure, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there's none besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children, but these two things will come to you in a moment, in one day, the loss of your children and your widowhood. They shall come up in their fullness, because of the multitude of your sorceries and the abundance of your enchantments, you have trusted in your wickedness. You have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you. You've said in your heart, I am, and there's none beside me. Therefore, evil will come upon you. As you shall not know from where it arises. It will fall upon you. You shall not be able to put it off. It will come upon you suddenly, and you won't know. Exactly what this verse says. 
right? When, when all is said and done, those who live and die with stuff here to the very end are going to find themselves destroyed, unable to stand. So her wishful life, verse 8, is destroyed in an hour, in a day, if you will. Notice what it says there. Her plagues will come to her in a day. As ancient Babylon fell to the shock of everyone who, who was a part of it. By the way, Babylon ruled the world. Daniel chapter 5, it fell in, fell in one night. It ruled the world and fell in one night. As we said, chapter 17, the, the seven final judgment will come so quickly that, that it really will feel like just a day has passed and everything is gone. When the handwriting of the Lord upon the wall to the Babylonians was, today your kingdom is taken from you, so will chapter 18 be. <laughs> whatever you think you're hanging on to, whatever's left is, is now going to be gone. It sure does make you want to invest in eternal things. So beginning in verse 9, we're then given the reaction of those who are most affected by the loss. From the kings and the merchants and the traders, those whose life was buying and selling, they proclaim what they see, and it's exactly what God has said. It's going to fall in an hour. It will leave them weeping for their loss. So verse 9 says this, The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live luxuriously with her, will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, they say, alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that great city, in one hour your judgment has come. So here are the world leaders standing off in fear, but yet weeping for their loss. Now, all you have to do is back up to chapter 16, and you remember that one of the last things that falls upon the earth it is this huge earthquake, right? That shakes everything that can be shaken. And these 100-pound hails falling, it, it doesn't take long before it is quickly destroyed. We, we read in verse 11 that the merchants of the world will weep and mourn over her. No one buys their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver, of precious stones and pearls, of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every sort of object of the most precious wood and bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, incense, fragrant oils and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and even the bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for there's the key, has gone from you. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. But the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance, and out of fear of her torment, they will weep and moan. And again, they will say, Alas, alas, that great city which was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. In one hour such a great riches have come to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship and, and sailors, and as many as travel on the sea, they will stand at a distance and cry out when they see the smoke of her burning, and they'll say, what is like this great city? And they will throw dust on their heads and wail, weeping, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all of the ships of the sea had become rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been made desolate. The key is verse 14. And, and maybe you circle that in your Bible if you're taking notes, because the Lord literally says, everything that your soul wanted, everything that you were lusting for, the richness, the splendor, in an hour, it's gone. It is gone. The minute you die, you're taking nothing with you. And the surrounding verses kind of around this key verse give a partial but kind of a detailed list of some of the things that they were mourning the loss of. The merchants, verse 11 and verse 15, the business owners selling their goods, now no one's buying. And they join the kings in their weeping of losses. In verses 12 and verse 13 and verse 16, all of the things that had been a profit to them no longer were. Everything of value is gone. The precious stones, the jewels, the fancy gold and wood and marble, the finest of the clothing, verse 13, the expensive herbs and spices and wines and oil and food 
and then the power that comes with horses and chariots, and even the owning of slaves, all for the gain of material goods. Today, the lust for things continues, monopolized by advertisers who you know, use target groups and work hard at creating need. And so the thing continues, but here it stops. When the Lord comes, this is over with. But, but God wants you to see that religion and, and the pursuit of these things is, is what hampers man maybe more than anything else. It's what Satan would, would love to use. You know, we, we, I have advertisers goes after kids to tell them that they should have certain cereals, you know, have certain tennis shoes. For a while there it was Cabbage Patch Kids. You remember those? They don't seem to be around anymore. I don't know. But there's something else. Now we got iPads and iPods and and uh, Jordan had tennis shoes. I remember as a high school kid, how many of you remember uh, Jack Purcell tennis shoes? No? What's wrong with you people? <laughs> Amen, my brother, good to see you. High five. The only 80-year-olds here, I guess. But they were way too expensive for my dad. And I said, Dad, I, everybody's getting those. Well, not everybody's getting them, but I wanted some. And he said, no, you can't have those. But I thought, i, I, I got to have those. But, but it doesn't stop when you're a kid. Now, you know, how many, how many things are, are you in hock for tonight because you had to have something? And, and because we're not really good at distinguishing want from need. We confuse them. How, how much need do you really face? The rest is created in the want department, right? And the want department, for most part, lures to the flesh and is driven by the devil. Just the way it works. Commercialism is not from God in that sense, but Babylon will be destroyed in this day and the many lives that have been destroyed by it, this worldly mindset, you know, the soul that is sold to it, it's the slavery of the system. And so we've got to be careful. When Jesus um, ran into that fellow in the crowd and, and he said, teacher, could you tell my brother to share his inheritance with me? And Jesus said, well, man, who made you me a drudge or an arbiter over you? But then he said this, take, take heed, be careful of covetousness. For your life does not consist of the abundance of the things that you possess. That's not your life, man. So be careful. And, and then he told that parable of the, the rich guy with the, with the you know, crops that grew in the bigger barns. And, and what am I going to do now? I'll put my feet up. I got stuff for years. And the Lord says, well, you're such a fool. You die tonight. Then who gets those treasures that you've laid up for yourself? And then he said, that's how everyone is that is not rich towards the Lord, but just after the riches of the world. So this, is, this chapter is all about God's foot coming down and all of that. And like I said, the headstone saying, here lies man's greatest quest without God. Jesus is coming to destroy that which destroyed man. And I want you to just point out as we read through these verses a little bit quickly that it, it continues to say, and again, oh, and again, in, a, in an hour. <laughs> We can't reverse the trend of life in the world. It's going to go like that until the Lord comes. But the Lord will put an end to it. And the government of the Antichrist, which epitomizes these lusts, will be brought to nothing in a moment. One word from the Lord when he returns in a few weeks, when you're here with us, and it will leave the, word, uh, the, the rulers and, and the merchants in tears. And notice from verse 17, 18, and 19 that the, that the traders and the suppliers share the same sentiment. Their life is over now because they've invested heavily in the system and now it's gone. And yet another group kind of hangs its head in grief over the loss. Go read Ezekiel, I think, chapter 27 and chapter 28 where the Lord talks about the riches of men and, and the, the wisdom in trading those riches and that the, the Lord says, don't you set your heart upon them. They're not to be your God. And yet it was. Verse 20, rejoice over her, O heavens, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Interesting. The very system that stood in the way of many coming to the Lord is now bought down for good. A call to those who have had to reach man with the good news as they had to fight against the world's way of operation is now told they can rejoice because that has been Removed great joy in heaven. In fact, look at verse 1 of chapter 19. We, we'll read ahead. We'll cheat a little bit. <laughs> After these things, I heard a, a voice of great multitudes in heaven saying, Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power belongs to the Lord our God. And true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Everyone said, hallelujah. God has made things right. Same thing we just read here in verse 20. Certainly the, the long-standing question of the prosperity of the wicked and the suffering of the righteous is settled once and for all in this verse, right? This is where it all gets right. The righteous will triumph. The wicked will suffer the loss of everything. How important you always have the mind of Christ when you look at these things because we have such short-term views and we really need this longer term. God will do as God has said. Well, then we read in verse 21, then a mighty angel stood up, or sorry, took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. And the sounds of the harpists and musicians, flautists and trumpeteers, shall not be heard in you any more, nor craftsmen of any craft will be found in you any more, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more, and the light of a lamp shall not shine in you any more, and the voice of the wide groom and the bride shall not be heard in you any more, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all of the nations are being destroyed. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints, and all of those who've been slain upon the earth. So back in Babylon, ancient Babylon, the word of God had come there in Jeremiah chapter 21 and uh, 51. This is what the Lord had said to the Jews in captivity. When you arrive in Babylon and see it and, and read all of these words, then you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off so that we that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but will be desolate forever. Now it shall be, when we have finished reading this book, that you shall tie a stone to it and throw it into the Euphrates and say, the Babylon will sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon it. They shall be weary. These are the words of Jeremiah. So to the captive people in Babylon, God said to his people, throw a rock into the, into the ocean, if you will, into the Euphrates. This is going to be the sinking. Here's the exact imagery that is found thousands of years later using the exact same word as the prophet Jeremiah did. And we read it over and over again. Look at verse 14, look at verse 22, verse 23. It will rise no more. The days when prophets were admired for their business savvy, the, the sorcery and the spiritism as a way of life, the, the willingness to persecute the church, kill the Christians, no more. No more. Rejoice. <laughs> O oh, heavens and holy apostles, God has come to avenge you. And then you get to chapter 19 and you go, all right, let's start singing now because Jesus is coming. Next week, Jesus is coming. Yay! Come on, hear it for our goodness. Add it. <laughs> and it'll be a system that blesses and honors the Lord. You, you all really have to ask yourself one question. Am I a citizen of heaven or of Babylon? Because until you come to Jesus, you're still a citizen of the world, you know? And, and the best you can do is, is survive in this culture and get ahead and everyone can applaud your, your smartness and you, you're so, you're, you're wealthy, you're wise, you're powerful. And then you're going to have to bow before Jesus because he's the only one that matters. So, read ahead. I know you're not going to miss next week, are you? I don't want to miss next week. I hope you'll be here with us. Shall we pray? Father, how thankful we are tonight as we sit together for your great love for us. And I know that, that Lord, as, as we read these last two chapters especially, they're, they're hard to read, but they're so, they're so straightforward that, that man's religion and man's commerce will find their end, will find their fulfillment in the Antichrist's last world government, but then will find their end in a moment's time as the, the last words of judgment proceed from our God. And as these bold judgments fall and this life ceases and, and the investments of man apart from God dry up, the lamenting of those who invested in the wrong thing is going to be loud. But the peace of those who know the Lord will find them in God's presence years before this all takes place. So you want to be sure that tonight, whether you're here or 
you're next door in the overflow or you're listening online, that you're right with God. That, that, that you, you aren't trying to mix together your faith in Jesus with, you know, I, I believe in Jesus if he can make me rich and can heal me well and he can go make my life easy and, you know, and prosper. I want to be a religious guy. You don't need to be a religious person. You want to have a relationship with Jesus. It's all about a person. It's not about what you do for him. It's what he's done for you. It's about his accomplishments, not yours. And you may never have much in this life. God never promised you riches. He promised to provide for your needs. Told you to be content when those needs were provided. The insatiable desire for more is usually a product of, of, of being trained in this world to never be satisfied. It's what you know, advertisers work at and, and dream of. Create need and then try to feel it, fill it. But praise the Lord, man, we have, we have more important things to do. We have bigger fish to fry, so to speak. We've got to reach the souls of the, of, of the people that are lost. We've got to take the word of God to them and pray for them and, and be about our Father's business because this world is ending soon enough and God will put an end to it once and for all when his son comes. So if you don't have Jesus, look, you can, you can invite him to be the Lord of your life tonight. You can become a citizen of heaven. You can come out from among them and be separate. And as the Lord said through Paul to the to the Corinthians, I'll be your father. You'll be my sons and daughters. You can be adopted into God's family by embracing his son. You can turn to Jesus and you'll find life with him. And there's nothing else you need to do except exalt his name and honor his sacrifice and depend on his work and believe his word. And you'll have life. And then you can be delivered from all of the, the, the lusts of the flesh that, is, that drives the world around you and the hopes of, of political gain, one party and the other, as if somehow that's going to deliver us from sin. It will not. According to Daniel, the world will not get better. It will get worse. According to everything the Bible says, it will not get better. It will get worse. Incrementally, unnoticeably, but worse it will be. But we're waiting for Jesus. And then it's going to get a whole lot better real fast. So thank the Lord that he's delivered us from, you know, the deceptiveness of religion and the, and the emptiness of commercial gain so that we can rejoice in what we have and be thankful for what God's given us. And tonight you can ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You just got to come and speak to him and cry out. Call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, and you shall be saved. Come to me, and I'll no wise cast you out. That's God's promise. That's the, that's the good news. He'll take you just the way you are, but he won't leave you that way. He'll try to begin to work. Well, he won't try. He'll begin to work in you, his work. So wherever you're sitting, wherever you're listening, wherever you are, Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Lord, take my life and make of it what you will. Thank you for, for dying in my place. Thank you for your sacrifice so that I don't have to be, be shackled with the you better do better kind of attitude. I can't. You can do it in me. It's your power. It's your promise. It's your goodness. Save me, Lord, and make me into the person you want me to be. May I honor you, learn of you. And that prayer just said, with sincerity of heart, God will respond. And he will begin this work that you'll notice. And then we'd love to give you some Bible studies to take home and, and, and look up the scriptures so you can come up afterwards. We'll, we'll give you some. Or if you're online, you can follow the links and, and find them there. But, oh, God's word is so good. <laughs> and, and know this, he, he has the last word. He is the last word. Make sure you know him before he comes.